these motherfuckers. When you niggas. Would you like to be an Obama speechwriter in one easy lesson? It's easy. Let's just get to it. In general, then we'll get to specific on how he applied all these rules in his recent speech in Dallas at the memorial for the dead cops. Okay, so the first thing is, whatever you want to do, you have to give a different reason for it. Example, uh, I believe in the Second Amendment. That's why I want to grab your guns. I believe in competition. That's why I want to nationalize the public health care system. I believe in equality for all races. That's why we have to have different standards for black students. That's why we have to have affirmative action. That's what. That's why we have to have racial quotas. I believe in a strong America. That's why we have to capitulate to Islamic terrorists all around the world at every turn. You get it? You can, as long as you can do that, you can write Obama speeches all night and day. And so this one was no different. We started, you, start, you start this speech out by saying, well, what do you want to do here? One, you want to draw a moral equivalence between the cops and the protesters and the guys who got killed. Yeah. Uh, to me, he ain't doing no wrong. He just shot a cop. Everybody's just the same, right? So at every opportunity, let's mention the guys who were killed, Philando and Alton, you know, the criminals with the guns and the long records. Let's do that. And we'll mention them in the same breath as the cop, the same breath as the protesters, and we'll just mix them all together. And, okay, and every opportunity, m- m- diminish and marginalize all the bad stuff the, pro- the so-called Black Lives Matter people have done, d- diminish their violence, ignore the violence, ignore the threats, and if you acknowledge it, just say hey, it was only a few people and it was other people who did it. When it comes to cops, kind of the same thing, but in reverse. Will kind of enlarge, you know, their responsibility for the fact that they're constantly being attacked by black people. We'll kind of blame it on the cops and we'll say, oh, we understand they have a tough job, so don't worry about it. And, and so the speech here that he gave in Dallas was a perfect example of that. So why don't we take a look at that part of that speech? What we're going to do is we're going to take out just the, 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 the first part of the statement. You know, the part where he goes, well, I believe in the Second Amendment. That's why we got to grab your guns. Why don't we just stick with the grab your guns part, run through the speech with some good stuff in the background, and we'll kind of see what he really meant, which is black people are relentless victims of relentless white racism all the time, everywhere. That explains everything, especially why cops are always picking on black people for no reason whatsoever. For seven and a half years, Obama and his crowd have been the most race conscious administration in the history of this country. They see everything through race. Any amount of racial disparity between white people and black people, there's only one reason for that. That is white racism. This speech was no different. No, this speech is a shining example of that. Let's see if we can decode it a little bit. When they were assigned to protect and keep orderly a peaceful protest in response to the killing of Alton Sterling of Baton Rouge and Philando Castile of Minnesota. And despite the fact that police conduct was the subject of the protest, despite the fact that there must have been signs or slogans or chants with which they profoundly disagreed, these men and this department did their jobs like the professionals that they were. And then around nine o'clock, the gunfire came. Another community torn apart, more hearts broken, more questions about what caused and what might prevent another such tragedy. I know that Americans are struggling right now with what we've witnessed over the past week. First, the shootings in Minnesota and Baton Rouge. The protests. Then the targeting of police by the shooter here. An act not just of demented violence, but of racial hatred. Off, All of it's Get off me, left us wounded Get off me, and angry Get off me. What the fuck is you bothering me and for? Hurt. I can walk anywhere the fuck I want to. Poor ass niggas. 
This is a, the deepest fault lines of our democracy have suddenly ass. been exposed, you you understand? perhaps you even widened. Although we know that such divisions are not new, though they've surely been worse than even the recent past, that offers us little comfort. Faced with this violence, we wonder if the divides of race in America can ever be great. And if your bitch ass had enough authority, you would have been able to do something. We wonder if an African-American community that feels unfairly targeted by police and police departments that feel unfairly maligned for doing their jobs can ever understand each other's experience. And today in this audience, I see people who have protested on behalf of criminal justice reform grieving alongside police officers. I see people who mourn for the five officers we lost, but also weep for the families of all the disturbed, Orlando Castro. If we are to honor you bitch ass nigga. These five outstanding officers who we lost. Then we will need to act on the truths that we know. And that's not easy. It makes us uncomfortable. When you niggas gonna unite But we're gonna have to be honest with each other and ourselves. We also know that centuries of racial discrimination, of slavery and subjugation and Jim Crow, they didn't simply vanish with the end of lawful segregation. They didn't just stop when Dr. King made a speech or the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act were signed. Race relations have improved dramatically in my lifetime. Those who deny it are dishonoring the struggles that helped us achieve that progress. But we know But America, we know that bias remains. We know it. Whether you are black or white or Hispanic or Asian or Native American or of Middle Eastern descent, we have all seen this bigotry in our own lives at some point. We heard it at times in our own homes. If we're honest, Perhaps we've heard prejudice in our own heads and felt it in our own hearts. We know that. And while some suffer far more under racism's burden, some feel to a far greater extent discrimination stink. Although most of us do our best to guard against it, and teach our children better. None of us is entirely innocent. No institution is entirely immune. And that includes our police departments. We know this. And so when African Americans from all walks of life, from different communities across the country, voice a growing despair over what they perceive to be unequal treatment, when study after study shows that whites and people of color experience the criminal justice system differently. So that if you're black, you're more likely to be pulled over or searched or arrested. More likely to get longer sentences. More likely to get the death penalty for the same crime. When mothers and fathers raise their kids right and have the talk about how to respond if stopped by a police officer, yes sir, no sir, but still fear that something terrible may happen when their child walks out the door? Still fear that kids being stupid and not quite doing things right might end in tragedy? When all this takes place more than 50 years after the passage of the Civil Rights Act? We cannot simply turn away and dismiss those in peaceful protest as troublemakers or paranoid.
We can't simply dismiss it as a symptom of political correctness or reverse racism. When you niggas gon' unite and kill the police. To have your experience denied like that, dismissed by those in authority, dismissed perhaps even by your white friends and co-workers and fellow church members again and again and again, it hurts. Surely we can see that. All of us. These things we know to be true. And if we cannot even talk about these things, if we cannot talk honestly and openly, not just in the comfort of our own circles, but with those who look different than us or bring a different perspective, then we will never break this dangerous cycle. With an open heart, police departments will acknowledge that just like the rest of us, they're not perfect. That insisting we do better to root out racial bias is not an attack on cops, but an effort to live up to our highest ideals. And I understand these protests, I see them, they can be messy. Sometimes they can be hijacked by an irresponsible few. Police can get hurt. Protesters can get hurt. But even those who dislike the phrase Black Lives Matter, surely we should be able to hear the pain of Alton Sterling's family. This is we should hear the students and co-workers describe their affection for Philando Castillo. As a gentle soul, Mr. Rogers with deadlocks, they called him. That last lie about Philando Castile wasn't any bigger or smaller than any of the other ones he, uh, he told just now. Philando Castile was a gangbanger. Here he's, here's a little post he made. How much he didn't like gay people, he didn't like Jews. He smoked a lot of dope, did a lot of drugs with his girlfriend in front of her kid. And now we hold him up as a gentle soul with dreadlocks. That's perfect. You know, this relentless moral equivalent, I mean, that's another landmark, hallmark, trademark of Obama. You know, Orlando Castile guy, Philando Castile, he's just the same as a cop, just found, you know, they both, they both just kind of two ships passing in the night. That's all it was. There was no gun. There was no misconduct, well, except for the cop. He was kind of a bad guy. But other than that, can't we just get along? That's all we needed. We need Rodney King to come in at the, in the middle of that speech and give the old can't we just get along speech. Or even better, we needed... Uh, Congressman from Kansas City to come in and remind us of my favorite piece of advice from Obama. Don't make the black kids angry.